Hello, everyone, and welcome to Bubbler Banter on the Bruce Sports Network, the show where we spout off about Wisconsin sports. I'm Josh Scheibe, and back in the studio is my co-host, Ian DeMars. <laughs> we do have a quick announcement to start the show. Unfortunately, today's show will be our last. We've had a good run, but due to a few different factors, after today, Publer Banter will be discontinued. I've enjoyed being a part of Brew Sports and obviously hope to continue being a part of it moving forward. Ian, anything to uh, add here? It's a sad day for Bubbler Banter. That it is. And I do want to thank you, Ian. It's, it's been a pleasure working with you. Yes, give me the good old handshake. There Why not? <laughs> and I do also want to thank my, my, my other little co-star, my tiny little cup here, which has been hit hardest <laughs> by this whole thing. As you may have noticed, my, my drinking vessels have been literally downsized over the past few weeks. Um, so I, I, I hope that they can all recover from this. I know this is heavy stuff to start this show, but... Let's have some fun and get this show on the road. Josh, do you want to talk about the gift that Baxter gave you this morning? Oh, yeah, that one. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the chicken wing sugar lip scrub. I hear this has been kind of floating around the Bruce Sports uh, <laughs> studios. Um, it may keep floating around. I may not <laughs> take it with me. We will see here. Um, anyway, so despite what it looks like or feels like outside, spring is here. And that means that baseball's back, too. Joining us on the phone to talk about that a bit is Mitch Nellis from the Big 920 here in Milwaukee. Hey, Mitch, how you doing? I'm doing great, guys. Uh, I don't know how I follow up that open. Uh, you know, I wish <laughs> both of you luck, and uh, I'm excited to be a part of history. Well, thank you very much. Glad to have you here on the final show. Uh, it looks like uh, the Brewers are going to have a, an interesting season, to say the least. Uh, let's talk a bit about the starting rotation. Who do you think... Uh, who do you think it's going to end up being, and, and how do you think it's going to go? Uh, you know, I, I'm kind of the, the Occam's razor guy, so I kind of think the path of, path of least resistance is who it ends up being. You know, we know Guerra, we know Davies. Uh, you know, you look at the other names, and, and certainly with Nelson Peralta and Garza are kind of the most obvious. Jake Anderson earned a spot with his pitching last year, and, and we'll see how that works as well. And I know Tommy Alone's trying to butt in there. Um, but But to me... You know, as you're looking as a team that's trying to build itself, but also trying to find some trade partners, maybe for some of the pieces, <laughs> Matt Garza. Um, you know, I, I think Matt, Matt Garza has to be in that rotation because if you're going to get something for him, you have to show value there. Uh, you have to see what you have in the for Peralta. You know, is he the pitcher he was early in his career? Was he the horrible mess of a pitcher for a year and a half? Or was he the pitcher he was at the end of last year? Um, so they have some options, which is nice. And the nice thing about it as well is that all these guys are healthy today, but they're not going to be healthy a week from now. They're not going to be healthy a month from now. Starting rotations, when you have extra starters, have a funny way of working themselves out so that you cull yourselves down to five uh, without having to make too many tough decisions generally. Yeah, I, I would probably have to agree with that. I mean, you look at Garza, for example. He's been injury-prone these last few years ever since he's been with the Brewers. So having at least six, maybe seven possible starters to have just to fill in, that's definitely something that would benefit the Brewers down the road. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and I, you know, you always want to have too many more than not enough. And, and granted, you might have too many number two, number three, number five starters as opposed to a true number one and moving on from there. Um, but, but if you have healthy bodies who at least can give you major league competent innings, uh, you, you know, that's something that you, you have to feel pretty comfortable going into the season with. Okay, so Mitch, if you had to name the five right now that you would have in the rotation, who would they be? The five that I would, I mean, I, I would just have the top five guys that we mentioned. You know, I would have Garrett Davies, Nelson Peralta, and Garza. Um, I do think Chase Anderson deserves a shot to be there, um, but I'm not sure who I take out. Um, so unfortunately for him, or unfortunately for him, you know, maybe he ends up being a trade piece. I know they got him from Arizona a couple of years ago, and it was a nice deal. Um, but, you know, maybe he's a guy that you start a couple times and can flip. Maybe Garza is a guy, you know, maybe he has a good April and May and somebody wants to take a shot on him. I, you know, I know the Brewers would love to, to trade him this season. Or maybe Peralta falls on his face. Uh, you know, and, and we don't really know about Junior Gary either. I mean, he had a really nice one season as a 31-year-old rookie. We don't know what that means. Uh, so, again, that's the five I'd start with, but that won't be the five at Memorial Day. That certainly won't be the five at Labor Day. Uh, so you start the season there, but that doesn't, it really doesn't mean too much. Well, who do you think will end up being the closer? Um, 
you know, they're going to do everything they can to have police be the closer, I think. Um, you know, whether it's his name recognition, whether it's salary, or whether it, it is his experience. Um, I know he's had a rough spring, um, but, you know, you look at a guy, and, and you look at what they did, what they turned their closers into last year. You know, you look at Jeffress, you look at Will Smith. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you know, the goal of a, of a growing franchise is to, you know, closers the easiest position to flip to other teams to build, you know, to get a couple prospects back. To get a couple of guys for the future. 2017 is not the Brewers' year. We all know that. 2018 might be the year they start looking better, but you know, 18 would be even be a bonus. I mean, 19 is really the year that everything's supposed to come together. So, if they, so Felice can have a couple nice months, and they can flip him for a couple of prospects. I think Stearns and company would be more than than happy doing that. And then you know, you go back to all the rest of the names: Torres and Barnes and Canable and uh, you know, guys from AAA. You just throw them all in the mix. Uh, to, to be that closer, kind of like they did at the end of the year last year. Yeah, I would probably say that Feliz is the guy you go to right now, but I thought he was an older guy. Apparently, he's only 28 years old, so, I mean, he's still... He's had, just been around yeah, for a he's while, just been around feels so like long. he's an older guy. Yeah. So, I feel like, depending on how the Brewers go, if he's having a good season, but yet they're playing below 500, it's going to be that time where, well, maybe we should do what we did last year, trade our closer, get some prospects, test out these young guys, and Maybe the Brewers will find out their closer for the future. Absolutely. And, and you know, as we look at the 2017 Brewers, uh, especially at that closer position, I mean, I'm a big flip guy. I mean, we didn't mention Thornburg who I know starting on the DL for the Red Sox, but, um, you know, the, to be able to get a starter for a guy who ended up being the closer for the last month of the year, I mean, it, it, even as a position player, I mean, that's not a bad spot to be in. So mm-hmm. uh, if the Lees or if some of the other arms, you know, all of a sudden Torres or, or somebody else, um, have great, you know, become great seventh or eighth inning guys, and they can flip them. Go ahead and flip them. Well, let's take a look at some of the new starters. Uh, Travis Shaw is going to be at third. Eric Thames at first. What do you? How do you think these guys are going to end up playing? Um, it, it is so hard to read the situation. You know, first base. You mentioned Thames, and and obviously his Aguiar had, had just an unbelievable uh, spring and earned his way onto that roster and. and you know, I know they put Thames out in, out in the outfield a little bit over the last couple of weeks, but you know, these two guys are really first base, and you know, to, to perform at a high level, there's something to be said for playing every day. And so, I don't know if uh, uh, if they're going to be able to uh, to, to flip flop or, or platoon. Um, you know, if Thames can hit like he did in Korea, um, you know, do you have another Chris Carter, a guy who hits 40 home runs but strikes out a lot? Or do you have do you have a guy who walks a lot? You know, we, even though we can look at all the metrics from Korea and, and it, it, you know, when he was in the majors before and the minors, we really don't know what we have there. You look across the diamond at a guy like Travis Shaw, and, and Shaw did a lot of growing up in Boston last year. You know, you start the season where he basically beat out Pablo Sandoval, mm-hmm. then Sandoval gets hurt the first couple of weeks, and Shaw becomes the main guy. But there was always other guys that the Red Sox were looking at bringing up and kind of platooning with Travis Shaw, a lefty who has some big pop but struggled against lefties. We'll see how much he gets to play every day, or does Hernan Perez, you know, how much does he get to play at third base? Um, but he's a steady player. He's a solid player. He, he had some very big hits for the Red Sox during the uh, during the pennant race last year. So, uh, you know, a guy at least who, you know, he's a little younger, but he's been through at least one pennant race, and, and so he can bring that experience to the team. Yeah, you look at Thames. I mean, he put up great numbers when he was over overseas, but – not that doesn't always translate to the big leagues, and I feel like that no, it does not. Looking at his spring, he hasn't done that bad. I feel like that he'll have a solid season if he puts up numbers like he did overseas. He'll, I looked it up today. He'll be. I think there was only one first baseman last year who actually hit over 25 home runs and stole 10 at least 10 bases, and that's what he did overseas. So if he could do that for the Brewers, that would be a big plus. I like the addition of Shaw. Like you, you were saying before, he played well with Boston last year, but we can't forget about Perez, too, who played really well for the Brewers down the stretch last year. So I feel like that Perez is going to be pushing, pushing Shaw, but there will definitely be time for him to play. But I feel like Shaw is the, definitely the guy that you want at third for now. Yeah, Shaw's the starter there, but I am, I, you know, I think that's a great par- point about Hernan Perez, and I want to see how much he pushes everybody, you know, how much he's going to push Shaw, how much he's going to press uh, push Arcia, and I know they want Arcia to, to really get a long look at shortstop, 
But if he's struggling, especially at the plate, you know, does Perez get a couple games there? Does he get some games at second base where he played a lot last year? Does he get some games in the outfield? Um, you know, we all remember the year Bill Hall had way back when, when he hit 35 home runs playing uh, every different position. And then they made him a, a full-time third baseman and it didn't work and, and tried to make him a full-time player. You know, some guys are just built to be uh, a floater mm-hmm. and a guy who plays five out of seven days but plays at a different position every day. Uh, and I think Hernan Perez might be that guy for the team this year. Well, I know you said it's 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 hard to read right now, and obviously this probably isn't going to be their year, but do you have any predictions in terms of how the season might go? You, I know you said they it it might look they might start looking better this season. Anything, it, um, anything more than that? They, they went they went seventy three and eighty nine last year. Is that right? I think that's right. I believe yeah. that's right. Yep. Yeah, I think that's right. I actually haven't predicted to have the exact same record. Um, really? And last year at seventy three and eighty nine. Um, I think we actually felt pretty good about what we learned about the team, what we learned about a, a number of these young players. Mm-hmm. I actually think this year is going to be exactly the same, um, you know, record-wise, but also what we learn about, you know, with with Keon Broxton, uh, with all the outfield. I mean, the, the AAA outfield right now might be the best Major League Baseball outfield in three years. I mean, with with the talent they have at AAA in the outfield. Um, what we learn about Arcia, what we learn about VR. Uh, you know, we mentioned the corner infield positions. There's so much potential there. And half of these guys are not going to be on the team in 2019 when we hope the Brewers are really contending. I mean, you look at last year's Chicago Cubs and you look at the roster, then you look at the roster from three years before, and I think Rizzo was the only guy who was there, and then Travis Wood, who's a middle reliever and a spot starter. So, as good as we think some of these players are, like as good as the Cubs thought that starting Castro was, a, an all-star shortstop, that, that doesn't matter. What matters is, is having a team that can compete for a championship, maybe an 18, but, you know, looking toward 19. And if that means VR is not on the team, if that means RC is not on the team, do we think today they'll be on that team? Sure. But if we can turn those into better pieces, I think David Stearns always has his ears and eyes open. So this year I expect – to learn a lot about these guys, a lot about the starting pitchers, a lot about the pitchers who we've seen um, at AAA, guys like Hader and Lopez. Um, but to me, it doesn't it doesn't matter really wins and losses. It matters learning process and it matters competitiveness. Yeah, I would probably say that they're probably going to do close to what they did last year. I feel like they might get to that 75-win plateau, but I agree with you. Sure. Last year, not many people thought they were going to do that well. I thought they were going to lose over 100 games. And you want to, what? I mean, you lose 89 games, but the way they played, I mean, they surprised a lot of people last year, and I feel like that they're going to continue to surprise people. And, like, I agree with your point. They're going to be pushing probably close to a possible wild card spot next year. Yeah, I mean, they, you know, at 73 and 89, what's funny about that record is it's all about expectations coming into the season. And I use this, uh, I use this analogy in football all the time. If the Cleveland Browns had gotten 7 and 9 last year, it would have been a huge success. If the Green Bay Packers had gotten 7 and 9 last year, it would have been an epic disaster. So it all depends on where you're starting from and what your expectations are. And the great thing about the Brewers going 73 and 89 last year is they didn't embarrass us. You know, they didn't go out every night and lose 10 to 1. And then in the games they won, they got lucky and won four to three. I mean, they played good at baseball last year. They played competitive baseball last year. They lost more than they won. But we saw some really good starting pitching. We saw some really good young players develop. I mean, Keon Broxton, I think, helped win me my fantasy baseball league at the end of the year (laughs) before he got hurt. Because he blew up. I mean, he was homering and stealing a base every game. It was unbelievable. Jonathan VR was a huge surprise with uh, you know, not with his speed and power, but how much speed and how much power he had. Um, so if we can keep learning and, and keep seeing positivity on the field, we have to be okay with this fact that it's not going to necessarily translate into wins and losses this year. But if you trust the process, and I know that's, a, that's an, at this point that's an oversaid saying in the world of sports, but it really is what we need to do. All right. Well, thanks very much, Mitch. Uh, glad to have you on the show. Glad to have your insight. Take care. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Have an awesome last show. I'm sorry to hear that this is the last show, but I know, uh, uh, you know, hopefully there's good things for both of you in the future. And uh, wherever you guys end up, keep in touch. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, guys. 
All right. Well, let's move on to our next segment then. It's called The Climbing Bucks. They have climbed now to fifth in the East. They had a big 103-100 win against the Celtics, largely thanks to Malcolm Brogdon's big finish. He either scored or assisted on their last 10 points of that game. Yeah, it's just crazy to see how the Bucks are playing. They're 13-3 and mm-hmm. in their last 16 games. It's just crazy to see how well they're playing. They're going 4-2 and two on a Western Conference road trip was also very impressive. And beating, as of right now, tied for the best record in the East last night in Boston, it's just it's amazing to see how the Bucks are playing right now, especially with Jabari Parker not even being in the lineup. Right. And they're also missing Michael Beasley, who's been a contributor off the bench, and John Henson, who gives them solid defense. Just to see the way that they're playing and the way that they're scoring is just... I wasn't even expecting this when Jabari went down. I thought the season was over. They've had a lot of guys step up yeah. and, and do what needs to be done to get where they're, they want to go. Yeah. I mean, look at Spencer Hawes. He didn't play, what, his first 14 or 15 games, and then they were struggling against Toronto. And then, what do you know, you see him about 10 minutes a game now, mm-hmm. which is good for him. And the way that you see, like, Brogdon, people were saying – well, he might not win rookie of the year, but looking at the way the stretch is going for them right now, you have to probably put him as the favorite. No offense to Dario Saric, he's playing great for Philadelphia, but just Brogdon's got to be yeah, in contention. He's I mean, be. just the way if you take Brogdon off the Bucks this year, I don't think they're a playoff team. Really? I mean, what do you think? I think that's entirely possible. Just he's he's put in outstanding performances the entire season. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would probably agree with you. Because you look at, I, if they didn't draft Brogdon, they wouldn't trade Michael Carter-Williams, which means they wouldn't have Tony Snell, which means you have Carter-Williams, who's been inconsistent his first couple of years in the league. One rookie of the year, people thought, oh, maybe he's going to develop into this great scorer, always had a nest for passing the ball, always was a solid defender, but he comes into Milwaukee, and he was just way too inconsistent. And it was a great trade that they made. Snell's been a huge ad, probably I'd say the key t- for the Bucks this season, along with Brogdon. And uh, I don't know, what do you have to say about what all could have happened if we didn't draft Brogdon or didn't trade Carter Williams? Well, I mean, it's all the domino effect, right? <laughs> um, I think it's interesting because seeing how many people have stepped up and, and the way that they've stepped mm-hmm. up uh, with these injuries to two of their, their better players – I don't know. Maybe if they hadn't drafted Brogdon, maybe some of these guys would have stepped up still. Yeah. I, I mean, know. who knows? Maybe it could have been Rashad Vaughn. Maybe. Mm-hmm. I mean, we've seen Jason Terry play well despite being, I think, 39. We've seen Beasley play well, even though people are starting to write him off a little bit. Mm-hmm. Greg Monroe always has been involved with the trade rumors, but he's probably, I'd say, top five for six man of the year. Just the Bucks are finding ways to uh, step their game up. Yeah, the potential of this team yeah. is so great. And they're, fine. they're acting on that potential as well. Okay, uh, did you get the chance to look at their remaining schedule? How do you think that they're going to do the rest of the year? Ooh, it's... Because you look at they have seven games, I believe, mm-hmm. remaining. Four of them are on the road. But you look at it, as of right now, only looks like three of them are against playoff teams. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, all those are on the road, but... You look at the schedule, they have two straight home games against the Pistons and the Mavericks. Then they have a three-game road trip against the Thunder, which will be on ESPN, uh, the Pacers, which they've played well against, the Sixers. Then they go home for their last game against the Hornets, and then they end the season back in Boston, who they just beat last night. You know, and I think it's going to be another sort of domino effect thing. Mm-hmm. They've been playing so well, like you said, 13-3 yeah. and three in their last 16 games. You almost have to wonder if they lose one, are they going to lose the rest? Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. Are they going to lose the momentum that they have? They could lose the momentum, but I just feel like that it's going to be hard to lose that momentum just the way that they're, they're playing, playing at such a high level yeah. right now. I mean, if you're saying this was only like a five game stretch that they were playing, yeah, they could easily lose possibly five out of seven. But you want to what? They've won 13 of 16 games. So that's definitely something that if mm-hmm. you can keep that going for a while you're going to keep that going into the playoffs. I think that looking at their schedule, uh, projected uh, win to loss would be 5-2. to two. I think the game at OKC is going to be a very tough game, especially what we saw from Russell Westbrook. He had a 57-point triple-double last night. That's the most points <laughs> you've ever had in a, that's in a triple-double in NBA history. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's probably the favorite to win MVP. And then I would probably say the other one, which might be a surprise, would be 
the Dallas game because Dallas yeah. is a team that you kind of have to look out for just because, well, Dirk Nowinski, one of the greatest forwards, I'd say, ever. They're a younger team. Harrison Barnes has played well for them this year. And it's a Sunday afternoon home game. And the Bucks kind of struggle in those Sunday afternoon home games. Look mm-hmm. at last week against the Bulls. I mean, losing by double figures, even though they were up early in that game. But mm-hmm. the Bulls just weren't missing. And the Bucks kind of took it a little easier, I figured. It looked like when they got to the middle of the fourth quarter, like, okay, we're going to lose this. Let's get some of the other guys in. But I feel like that last game at Boston, it's going to be a tough game. But if Boston's got the one or two seed clinch, it's best for them to rest their starters. And knowing Milwaukee, they're not going to rest their starters. They're right. going to come out. They're going to be aggressive. And look, after what they did last night, it wouldn't surprise me if they went there again. So Baxter asks uh, on Facebook, you think they make a deep playoff run this season? Like I said, it kind of depends on who they play because the matchups are kind of interesting. You look at... What if they fall to the eighth seed and play possibly Cleveland? Mm-hmm. They've played Cleveland tough all year, but it's Cleveland. You're going to expect them to play well in the playoffs. Right. If they play Boston, they've played Boston really well, losing one game in overtime and then getting the win last night, possibly could get another win towards the end of the season. You look at Toronto, that's the one that I'm a little scared of because the two games they played in Toronto, they were not good. Right. And the first game in uh, Milwaukee, they played close, couldn't pull down the end. And then you look at their most recent game where they won, very impressive, but they did get off to a very slow start. And then you look at Washington, which could be a possible matchup. I mean, John Wall, Bradley Beal, one of the best backcourts in the league. That's going to be going to be tough to defend. And they've played decently well against the Wizards this year. A matchup that I'm interested to see, which could Mm -hmm. very likely happen if the Hawks start to play well, could be maybe against the Hawks. It's very unlikely that could happen now, but they've always played close. They've, I remember I went through the two home games against the Hawks. Okay. First game, they were dominating that first half. They were up 22 at the half, and they end up losing. I mean, something you don't want to see if you're a Bucks fan. Right. Then you look at the last game, it was kind of a back-and-forth game. It was one of those games where they were leading most of the first half, but then the third quarter came, and that's kind of been the Bucks' weaker quarter this year. Mm-hmm. And they end up losing the lead, but then Brogdon, the way he's been playing lately, comes up clutch towards the end and helps the Bucks get a victory. So I feel like if I had to pick one team I'd want them to play, I'd kind of want them to play Boston just because, yeah, you have to stop Isaiah Thompson in the fourth quarter, but you look at they've kind of done that the first couple of games against them, losing in overtime at home and then getting the win last night. I mean, who would you who would you like to see them play in the playoffs? Oh, <laughs> I think it's easier to say who I don't want to see them play. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I think I think the the Cleveland game would probably be the most interesting one. Yeah, that would be interesting. See. I feel like people thought last year that Detroit was going to push them. They ended up sweeping Detroit. Mm-hmm. I don't feel like that'll happen if they play. The Cavaliers, or or if more, yeah, if Cleveland plays Milwaukee, I feel like it'll go at least five games, maybe a sixth. Who knows? Maybe they could pull up the upset mm-hmm. and beat them. But I feel like the best matchup overall for them would be the Celtics, just because I feel like they can match, they can guard Isaiah Thomas. Sure, they the size matchup really isn't an issue for them. Mm-hmm. And they did beat them in a close game. Exactly. You know, um, and we've talked a bit about the Henson and Beasley injuries. Do you think they're going to find a way back into the rotation once they're healthy? It's kind of tough just because of the way the Bucks are playing right now. I mean, you don't want to mess up a rotation when right. it's working. Henson, I feel like, is going to find that way in. I feel like maybe he takes the away the minutes from Spencer Hawes, even though I kind of don't want that to happen because Spencer Hawes is a stretch five. He can shoot the three for them. And you look at... Beasley, he's been out for longer than expected, so there's definitely something up with that knee. And, I mean, I feel like he could easily find his way back into the rotation because he used to be that first guy off the bench. Mm -hmm. Maybe he takes minutes away from Tlodovich. Maybe he takes a couple minutes away from uh, Jason Terry, but it kind of depends. If he comes back towards the end of the season and he's struggling to score, I don't see him getting in the rotation during the playoffs. And Henson... He's kind of been that guy where he comes in towards the end of the first half, middle of the fourth quarter for defense, which I love because he's a great defender. But like I said, it kind of depends on how the Bucks are rolling. If they 
are struggling towards the end of this season, put them in there, see what happens. If they're continuing to roll, you have to stick with what you're doing. All right, well, let's uh, let's move on now to our next segment. It's called Badger Shock, the uh, game that nobody wants to talk about. 83-84, lost <laughs> to the Gators at the buzzer. Um, Josh, where were you when that happened? I was actually at home in the dark trying mm-hmm. to nurse a migraine, <laughs> uh, so I wasn't able to watch the game. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I did get to watch the highlight reel, mm-hmm. and, man, it just seemed like one of those games they write in movies about. Yeah. You know, it, it just it just went the wrong way. Yeah. You know, each team played really well, went back and forth. Though I suppose if you're a Florida fan, it went the right way. Yeah. I mean, just looking at that game, you you, you see the start of the game, they're up 16. You're like, oh wow, they might just blow the doors off and mm-hmm. beat them badly. But then, knowing Florida, they're one of those teams that they're never out of it, even if they get down big. They have a solid bench. Their starters don't get enough recognition, and they just came out and. Surprised the Badgers, I feel, towards the end, especially with the buzzer beater at the end. But Yeah, it seems like it was the sort of game you, you love to watch as, mm-hmm. a, as a basketball fan. Not yeah. necessarily as a fan of either of these teams, but just as a fan of basketball, it was an entertaining game. Yeah, I mean, when you, when I saw Kanid, uh he left the game for a little bit because he was cramping. I was like, this isn't looking good. This could be the end because he's been our clutch player. But who steps up? Zach Showalter. And he ends up showing the title belt. I mean, it was a little early since... <laughs> he only tied the game, but, I mean, to see confidence from him was just huge. So, uh, got to ask this question. What cost the Badgers? I think it was probably the free throw. Oh, yeah. The free throws, which has plagued them all season long. I mean, you look at Nigel Hayes. He's trying to prove to NBA scouts that he should be drafted. Mm-hmm. And you look at a game where you miss, I believe he missed like seven free throws. Seven, yeah. That's unacceptable. That's huge. You're a senior. You have to make these free throws. If you're Nigel Hayes and you look at, he made the two at the end, but Mm -hmm. he had chances in overtime to put that game away. Well, and in a game like this, one or two during regular play, Mm -hmm. one or two extra points, that that could seal the game for you. I mean, yeah, that's definitely a thing. I mean, who knows? If Keenan was fully healthy, that's completely different story. I feel like the Badgers pull away in that game. Because, like I said, he is one of the best clutch players in college basketball. And you look at cramping's always an issue when you play those games in March Madness and ended up hurting him. But uh, one thing I wanted to ask you, after he made that second free throw, do you think that they should have called a timeout, set up the defense, or do you think it was the right move to yeah. play it out? I think they probably should have. It's hard to say because mm-hmm. it went, you know, the game ended up going one way. Yeah. We see the result for that. I think they probably should have called the timeout. Yeah, that's kind of what I agree because you look at look at regulation. They, uh, I think Florida called a timeout before mm-hmm. that play, and who did they have to guard the ball? Ethan Happ, big guy, guy you want to have on the ball. Right. And what they do, they end up forcing a turnover and getting a shot off to possibly beat the Flo- beat Florida mm-hmm. in regulation. And you look at what happened. Happ wasn't even near the ball, and you look at the way it came in. I was like, they either have to trap him because if they let him go, he's going to get a free ro- look. At the basket. That's exactly what happened. They didn't defend it well. I like the move that they took Kane to go, but you have to call a timeout there. Set up the defense. Calm the nerves for the guys because mm-hmm. you look at They were probably like, oh, we got this. We got this. But there's four seconds on the clock. I mean, what else do you expect? Yeah. It's 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 a hard decision to make in the moment as mm-hmm. well. You know, you got to. You got to do what you're going to do, but I I would have gone the other way. Yeah, I think if I were making that decision, that definitely hurt the Badgers, and mm-hmm. unfortunately ended their season, which means we have to look ahead to yep. next year. What do you think is going to happen now that Koenig, Hayes, mm. Shaw Walter are going to be gone? Well, like you said, Nigel Hayes is trying to show that he should be drafted. And do you think he will be? I think he could be, but based on his performance in the last few games, probably not. Mm-hmm. I I I wouldn't say so. I mean, he did play well in the tournament. Uh, I mean, in general, yeah. But I think I don't know. If but he, free throw shooting is going to hurt him, yeah, and he's going to have to prove to scouts that I can make these free throws. But when you show time and time again that you can't hit these free throws, mm-hmm. it's going to show that you're not going to get that money that you want. To be drafted because remember, I think it was after his sophomore year, could have been a first round pick. Last year, he was complaining that hey, you should. He was talking to the Celtics, hey, you should pick me third overall. 
<laughs> when people are saying you you're not even a first round draft pick, and you look at the way he played this year, he was inconsistent, and that's going to hurt him. I feel like if he gets drafted, it's going to be in the fifties. I mean, there's only sixty picks in the okay. draft, but yeah, I, he would definitely be in the in the lower half. I mean, for at sure. this point, Koenigs is gonna probably get drafted before him. Mm-hmm. If and you, if there's one Badger, I think that could get drafted, it's Koenig. I mean, because yeah. people say, well, what about Ethan Happ? Happ had a great year. He was a uh, voted third team All American. Good for him. Congratulations, Ethan. But he still has things to develop, and I feel like. If he tried going to the draft, it wouldn't help him. I mean, what do you think? Yeah, I don't know. I, and I'm, I'm saying that a lot. I don't yeah. know. Um, <laughs> it, I wouldn't. Hmm. I mean, viewers, what do you think? <laughs> uh, try commenting on the show and see if Hap should stay with the Badgers or if he should make a run for it and enter the draft. Because look at Harry Giles. Guy comes into the season, number one college recruit doesn't play the first 10 or so games because of a knee injury that's been hobbling him in high school. He's had Mm -hmm. two ACL surgeries. He had another surgery before the season, and you look at the numbers he put up, I think he only averaged like three points a game, only started about five or six games, and he's entering the draft, and people are saying this guy could maybe still be a lottery pick. Mm -hmm. And you look at Hap, and people aren't talking about him in the draft. Hap has to realize... If this guy only play only average three points a game and people are thinking he's going to be a first-round pick and they aren't thinking that about me, then maybe I should stay in school yeah, maybe, where maybe I know I could probably another be. another season. And, yeah. Yeah. Because, look, at, right now one of the best big men in the Big Ten, if he stays because Isaac Haas is going to be leaving Purdue. Caleb Swan again more than likely after the year he had is going to be leaving Purdue. He will for sure be the best big man in the Big Ten. I mean, do you think there's anyone that could beat him in regards to the best big man? Or? No, I don't. I, I think he's I, – I would agree with you. I think he is the best Cause we, could be the yeah, best. Yeah, because he has great offensive post moves. Mm-hmm. He rebounds the ball. There's been the foul issues, but that's a thing that happens with big guys is they get in foul trouble. And the one thing right. that he has to improve is the free throw shooting, which I feel another year, get that free throw percentage up 5% at least, will definitely help his draft stock. Well, any other thoughts on the the future of the Badgers uh, themselves or any of the individual players? I do expect Vito Brown to be singing a lot more national anthems. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I suspect (laughs) you're probably right. Well, let's move on to our next segment. It's called Patient Packers. As we know, the Packers aren't making very many moves, as usual, during the offseason. This is not an unusual thing. Why are you doing this to us, Ted Thompson? (laughs) Why? And, you know, fans keep asking that question. Should fans be worried? I mean, fans have been worried about this for years. Yes, but should they be? (laughs) Yes, they should be worried. Because (laughs) if Ted Thompson keeps doing this and they don't get a Super Bowl, you kind of have to figure that he's going to be out as their GM. Well, and the question is always, do you want a championship team or do you want a playoff team? Because the Packers have been pretty consistently going to the playoffs since Ted Thompson has been there. It's, yeah. it's been pretty consistent. Mm-hmm. However, they haven't had very many championship or Super Bowl wins. Mm-hmm. So you got a question. Is, is it effective to have a team that's consistently going to the playoffs and not winning the big game? Or do you want to have a team that maybe isn't so isn't so great in the playoffs but has a chance actually at the Super Bowl. It, I, it's kind of tough to say. Yeah. I mean, of course you want your team to make the playoffs every year, but if I mean look at this year for example, they kind of weren't really in the playoff picture for a while because mm-hmm. of the way they were playing and then towards the end of the season like wow, they're clicking. They're going to make the Super Bowl and everything. And that's kind of what I was expecting and then of course the downfall with the uh, Atlanta Falcons kind of hurt them, but I feel like that I'm glad that they're making the playoffs every year, but they need to make more changes to get to the Super Bowl. I mean, do you like what they're doing every year, or do you um, feel like that needs to change? I would love to see them draft, or not draft, uh, to hire some more free agents, mm-hmm. because I will say their their scouting team, in terms of, their, in terms of free agents, mm-hmm. have been great. The picks that they have brought yeah. in, 
I mean, you got some great players out of that. Yeah. And, it's... and I would like to see Thompson and the rest of the team maybe take more advantage of that, mm-hmm. um, especially with their, you know, not really being all that close to their salary cap. They've yeah. got some money to Yeah, burn. they have money. <laughs> so I would, I would like to see them perhaps take a shot and just hire some more free agents, mm-hmm. take a shot at the Super Bowl. And even if they don't hit the playoffs, okay. Yeah. I mean, if, and if you look at this free agency, it's not been as bad as it has been in the past with, like, getting people. They did sign Martellus Bennett. Mm-hmm. They did sign a backup in Lance Kendricks. They That's did true. sign Devon House. They did sign some people. But the fact that it's bad this season because they're losing a lot of people. I mean, you lose a Garden Lang. Mm-hmm. You lose uh, Julius Peppers. Right. You lose Dayton Jones. Lost Lacey. Lost Lacey. Yep. I mean... It's, it's too much. Yeah, it's you're, you're especially losing. when you thought that you were going to get a lot of these guys back. Right, and you know they they lost a lot of their their front line guys. Yeah, you know these these are the these are the first these are the first mm-hmm. string guys. And you figured that with your running back depth chart being slim as it is, mm-hmm. I think I looked today. They only have two active running backs, Montgomery, and I think I'm pretty sure they re-signed Kristen Michael. I think they did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But you figured that Lacey would be your number one priority this off season. And at the beginning of free agency, it seemed like he was going to be coming back on one of those one year deals. Mm-hmm. But I feel like Lacey said that you want to what I've had some good years here, but they're not really giving me the money that I deserve. I mean, before I got before he got injured last year, he was averaging I think close to five yards a carry, which is impressive. Mm-hmm. And you look at Seattle, they had a situation where their backs have not been that healthy the past couple of seasons, so let's why not take a shot at this guy? And that's something that I read an article earlier about how someone in the Packers were saying, "You want to what? We did want to keep these guys, but we just didn't feel like the money that p- teams were offering were what we needed to give them." Sure. Well, and Baxter asks on Facebook, "Do you th- do you guys think Ty can be the Packers' number one running back this season?" Because McCarthy thinks so. And McCarthy did come out and say, I think he should be the number one back. Yeah, and he definitely deserves that opportunity, but they have to give him the ball more. He can't just run the ball ten times a game and be like, that's it. He definitely needs to prove himself. Yeah, and the pa- if the Packers think he can be a number one running back, mm-hmm. then prove it by giving him the ball more. Give him more chances. Right. Don't let ro- I love Aaron Rodgers, but don't have him throw the ball close to 50 times a game because <laughs> you know what? They have a solid offensive line. Rodgers didn't get sacked that much last year from That's all true. the games I watched. So you have to give Montgomery that chance. Or if he's not working, give Michael a chance. Or if they decide to draft someone, give that person a chance. Give them at least 15 rushes a game. So what do you guys think? Do you, uh, do you think that uh, Ty Montgomery is going to be the number one back? Do you think he should be? Or do you think it should be Christian Michael or somebody else that they may find <laughs> somewhere in their roster? Um, let us know in the comments below. So here's my big question. Sure. I've seen this kind of proposed a few times now. Are they wasting Aaron Rodgers' prime? Is Aaron, well, first of all, is Aaron Rodgers in his prime? Second of all, are they wasting Aaron Rodgers' prime? It's kind of tough to answer because, <laughs> I mean, you look at Rodgers has put up great numbers and he has a solid receiving core. Mm-hmm. And you look at they keep signing – look at last year signing uh, Jared Cook. And this year they're signing even bigger weapons for him at the tight end position, which they did need to improve. Mm-hmm. But to say that they're wasting his prime, I would say kind of yes because they haven't really brought in that many people not. Ted Thompson wants to develop a lot of young guys. You have a lot of young guys on your roster as it is. It's time to go sign those free agents. Like when they signed Julius Peppers that one year, people were like, this is a great move. They needed a guy who can rush the passer and be a difference maker, be a leader in the locker room. That's exactly what he did. And to uh, see that now they're starting to let go of some of these guys who were leaders in the locker room just doesn't really make sense to me. I mean, do you think that they're wasting his prime? I I am beginning to think that more and more, mm-hmm. um, and it's it's tough to see fro- it's tough to see Rodgers get so frustrated, um, you know, playing the way that he's been playing, which is really great. Yeah, but it seems like things just aren't clicking behind the scenes, mm-hmm. and that means that they're not clicking on the field. Yeah, just 
it's hard to say because Rodgers said this week, hey, I can play as long as Brady plays. Mm. And Brady just said he could play six to seven more years, and he's 40 years old. Like, if you can get Rodgers for that long, you and, have to give him something. And, you know, I don't doubt Rodgers. Yeah. I don't doubt Rodgers in that he, I think he could – I think he could play. Yeah, because quarterback a long time. is one is the one position in the NFL where, besides kickers and punters, you get play into your forties. Mm-hmm. And in a lot of cases, they get they only get better with experience. Yeah. Look at Brett Favre. Right. It hurts to say <laughs> look at Brett Favre, <laughs> but you do have to look at him. I mean, his last le- season in Green Bay was probably one of his best ever. And then you look at when he went to the Jets and even the Vikings, he didn't decline necessarily that much. I mean, the one his last year with the Vikings where he was injured, yes, but like I said, that was an injury factor. So the Packers, they have to start signing people and getting the right people to come to Green Bay, or Rodgers is going to be at that point where I love the franchise, but I need to go somewhere else. Right, which Time to move on. you don't want to see if you're a Packers no, fan. No, of course not. So what's next for them? Well, what, do you, what do you think they're going to do here? <laughs> well... Uh, and that's always the question. I feel isn't like it? that they should uh, try and get a running back. No offense to Montgomery. I feel like he could be that number one guy down mm-hmm. the road. But I say they need to get a guy for a, a one year contract. Montgomery strikes me almost more as a Randall Cobb type. Yeah. Where he can kind of be slotted into just about any place. He's one of those guys where when he makes a play, he's yes. can't miss. But yes. But I think he needs. I, I don't think that running back should be his primary position, mm-hmm. personally. Yeah. I mean, look at if he could be labeled. If there was a label like fantasy where he could be running back slash wide receiver like they did last year for him, that's him exactly. I mean, I read a couple of days ago that Andre Ellington from the Cardinals switched from running back. They're fully switching him to wide receiver this year. And he's kind of a smaller guy. Mm-hmm. But you look at Montgomery, he's built like a running back, but he's got the size of a, of a receiver. Yeah, he do, and he looks... He's fast. Yeah. <laughs> He's fast, you know, and, and that, I think, is the biggest thing that they're looking for right now in a running back, mm-hmm. which makes sense because yeah. you want a running back mm-hmm. who's fast. But I don't think that Montgomery is the answer. No. I don't think the Montgomery is the answer this season. Yeah, I feel like that if they really aren't going to focus on getting a back through free agency, then maybe either a draft one, which people are saying Christian McCaffrey could be that guy. He definitely could be that guy. Or... I believe it's uh, Mora from Tennessee. I feel like he could be one of those guys who can be a three-down back where he can run the ball and catch the pe- the ball as well. Or if you're a Green Bay, maybe go after a specialist. Go after someone who can return the kicks, return the punts, mm-hmm. and Jabril Peppers. Because that guy is exciting to watch no matter what. Oh, yeah. I mean, he can play linebacker. He can play corner, safety, return kicks. He can mm-hmm. even play offense. He can do everything <laughs> for them. And I feel like that's something that – could spark this Green Bay team. not Because I know we talked about it a couple weeks ago. If they get him and they put him on special teams, he could make the Pro Bowl his first year. Yeah, I definitely think that's possible. And, you know, you have to ask now, because Clay Matthews and Julius Peppers were such a good pass-rushing team. Yeah. And now Julius Peppers is gone. And when he wasn't there, Clay Matthews was pretty great for a mm-hmm. while. And then teams started to adapt to him because they knew his play style. Yeah. They knew what the Packers were going to do mm-hmm. in terms of sending in the pass rush. Do you think they're going to find somebody, not necessarily comparable to Julius Peppers, but somebody who might help Matthews in that pass rush? I feel like they will, but they're not going to address that in free agency. I feel like they're more likely going to draft someone. I know a big name that they were mentioning with their first-round pick could be T.J. Watt, Mm -hmm. which would be a great move, and he's put up solid numbers through the combine. So I feel like that if they were to draft someone first, and it's not McCaffrey or Peppers, it's definitely T.J. Watt. If they make a trade to try and move up to get one of those guys, it'd be great. But I feel like that if they want to get someone to help out Clay Matthews with the pass rush, it's going to be through the draft and trying to develop. Even though a lot of people say draft or don't draft, get someone in free agency. Mm-hmm. The best thing I feel that should be best for them would be develop a pass rusher and go after someone in the draft. But um, uh, before we switch topics, yeah. do you think that Richard Rodgers' days as a Packer are going to be done with? Ooh. Now that um, they have Bennett and Kendricks. 
you know, Rogers put up decent numbers. Um, yeah. And he was he was performing in, a, in an okay way. Yeah, but and I, you look at he's got the one hail mary catch, which al- he almost <laughs> always felt more like a fill in mm-hmm. um, than than anybody else on on. The, the roster yeah and so, you look at last year when cook went down and he was mm-hmm. trying to step up he did okay but yeah you need someone to make big plays and yeah he did make the hill mary catch a couple of years ago but other than that that's not much that yeah, he's done I, I think honestly he may he may stay on the roster mm-hmm. at, you know for up until the trade deadline yeah maybe i don't know they, they may try to trade him away and get something mm-hmm. for him but i don't I don't anticipate him being uh, with the Packers for much longer. Yeah, I definitely agree, especially with the signings that they just had. Right. Well, let's uh, move on to our, our final segment, and it's our called final our segment final ever. segment <laughs> on our fourth show <laughs> mm-hmm. is our final fours. Ha <laughs> ha, what do you know? <laughs> what are Didn't the odds think of that? that was going to work out. <laughs> so <laughs> what we're doing here is discussing our final fours, not just for March Madness, but for – Everything. Everything. Everything we can think of. But uh, do a speed run here. Before we start, uh, <laughs> you want to talk to people about uh, the bracket that you filled out for oh, our group. Oh, yeah, that one. Because uh, as of right now, you're in last place. Uh-huh. I, I am in last place. I've been in last place. Who did since... you pick? Well, um, <laughs> <laughs> I signed up for a notification for, from this uh, particular bracket contest mm-hmm. to tell me when it was open because I was very busy. And it turns out I never got that notification, so I never actually filled out a bracket. <clears throat> um, so, you know, purple one all the way. If you want to check out his bracket, go to <laughs> Spruce Sports Network. <laughs> Please don't. There's, there's, there's literally nothing there. There is no bracket. <laughs> it's okay, but uh, anyway, sticking with March Madness, with the Final Four set, who do you have winning and making the championship? Who do you have? I, w- I want to know your answer <laughs> Okay, first. so I only had one of the Final Fours in my actual bracket, yeah. and that was Gonzaga. But you look at the games, I like Gonzaga to beat South Carolina. I love the run that South Carolina's been playing. Mm. But I just feel like Gonzaga has finally found that stretch to make it there. Okay. And they've been trying to do that for years now. And the fact that this could be their best roster, even though you don't really have that one – Huge superstar. I mean, they have William Goss. They have Karnowski, who's an animal down low. <laughs> but I feel like that just their depth is going to get them to the championship. And then it's kind of tough for the next game because you got UNC, who's coming off a huge win against Kentucky with the shot by May- Luke Mays. And then uh, you got Oregon, who's surprising people because they don't have Chris Boucher. Dylan Brooks hasn't been their best player this tournament, and yet they're winning games, and they're winning games impressively. Mm. I feel that Oregon's going to get there just because of their momentum, and I, but in the end, I feel that Gonzaga's going to win it all. All right. Well, I was thinking South Carolina, actually, mm-hmm. because they have <laughs> – I, I know, because they have had such an impressive run mm-hmm. recently. I, I think it's going to be important for them to carry the momentum forward yeah. that they've had, and I think they could just do it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, if you have any topics that you want us to name our final four of, just comment uh, in the comments here on Bubbler Banter for Bruce Sports. Now, uh, let's change topics. Uh, give me your final four. Of, we're getting close to the playoffs for basketball. Who do you think are going to be the two from the east, two from the west, and who's going to win Ooh. it all? Okay. Um, hmm. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, I'm going to say – hang on. Let me pull up. I don't remember everybody who's in the playoffs. Would right you like now, me so to name mine first to help you sure, out? Sure, that helps. Okay, while I so look this up. <laughs> okay, in the East, I feel that Cleveland's just going to end up getting there because it's Cleveland. They're going to bounce back, and I feel mm-hmm. that surprisingly, I'm going to go Washington, just because really? I I feel like they have one of the best backcourts in the East. I feel like they're going to push. They they're the best team I think that can push Cleveland. I feel that Cleveland wins that series in six out West. Golden State, they're going to get Durant back. They're going to get healthy. And I feel that they're going to beat Houston in the West. Yeah. And then in the end, it's going to be another classic. We're going to get (laughs) the Warriors and the Cavs again in the finals. But I just feel that the addition of Kevin Durant Mm -hmm. is going to make that difference. I feel that they beat the Cavs in six games. 
What do you think? Well, I think it'll probably end up being Cleveland almost for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also thinking Boston okay. from the east. Um, they've been – both of them have been yeah. pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they're number one and number two, so yep. that makes some sense. Okay. Um, Golden State, possibly, probably, I would say, just okay. because – yeah, you know, they have had such an impressive run. Mm -hmm. um, and then I don't know. I was also thinking maybe uh, maybe Houston. Okay. Um, Who do you have winning then? <sighs> if you had to pick today, I would say it might come down again to Cleveland and Golden State. Yep. And mm, if I had to pick, the way it's been going, probably Cleveland. Okay. Hey, right. you want to give me a final four topic? Sure. Uh, let's go away from sports for okay. a minute here. Uh, <laughs> what do you think about uh, your four, your final four movies, favorite movies? Ooh, how did I know you were going to ask uh, me I know, movies? I'm, I'm predictable. Well, I'm uh, one of those sports guys, so I'm going to have to – those are my favorite movies. If okay. I had to pick my final four, I'd pick The Blind Side. Love that movie. Uh, love Rudy as well. Mm. Uh, another movie I'd probably say is Friday Night Lights. And then – I'm going to say this series because I can't pick just one. I'm sure. going to pick Rocky. Okay. And then in my championship, I would have the blind side beating Friday Night Lights. And I would have Rocky beating Rudy. In the end, I'm going with the blind side just because it's such an emotional movie. All right. What about you? Well, I would definitely put in, uh, let's see, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Oh yeah, um, the Empire Strikes Back. Mm -hmm. I'm going with I'm going with all the the movies I grew up on here, and that's perfectly um, fine because I love all those <laughs> movies too. Um, probably number three would be John Carpenter's Halloween, the okay. original Halloween. Okay, and then hmm, number four. This is always a tough one. Yeah, it, everything always changes. <laughs> um, Pan's Labyrinth. Okay, is is a great one. Um, and so who do you have winning? <sighs> You know, it would come down probably between Empire Strikes Back and Raiders of the Lost Ark, and Raiders of the Lost Ark, all the way. It's Solid you know, pick. it's one of those movies that you can <laughs> I can I can watch as many times as I like, and I'm never going to get tired of it. Okay, Baxter commented, "Final four. What's the score, oh, panelists? No. Oh, oh no, tough one. Since I'm a panelist <laughs> and you're the game master, so yeah. uh, game I, master, I feel like we who do you have? Do this just so we're not picking favorites. <laughs> Obviously, you're one of my favorite panelists. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I have to say that. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I'd say, hmm, Ian, thank DeMars, you, Armin Sarian, Dan Pfeiffer, and hmm." <laughs> Doug Russell. And who would you have winning that Ooh, match? Um, Are you going based off of points? or No, I'm not going based off of points. I'm oh, going you're off hurting of... me since <laughs> I'm, I'm one of the best. I know. I know you are. <laughs> um, hmm. It would probably come down between, uh, let's see, Dan Pfeiffer and Armin. I'm sorry, Ian. It's okay. It's I'm okay. sorry. Who do you have winning? <laughs> who do you have? I want to um, know. Hmm. As much as I as much as I love you, Dan Pfeiffer, I gotta go with Armin. <laughs> Armin's my my final pick for the final four. What's the score, panelists? <laughs> now it's your turn. Okay, Get I'm. Not, I will seat. not name myself. <laughs> to be fair, because that's just not fair. If I had to pick my four based off my experience, no, well, one of them, Eric Condia, my mm. rival on what's the score because of our <laughs> school backgrounds. Dan Pfeiffer, I would also say. Um, let's see, two more. I love Scott Wisniewski. Oh, yeah. He's always a fun guy to listen to on that show. And the um, last one, Mitch Vomhoff, because that guy just never seems to win on that show. He comes <laughs> so close every time, and but he just never gets it done. And then my championship would be uh, Dan against Eric. And I'm going to give the slight edge to Eric just because we are rivals All on the right. show. And uh, – Hopefully one of these days I get to go against them again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, any other final fours that you can think of? All right. Let me take a look here. Sure. Because I had a lot of topics. I you, know... say you, you had a big list. Mm -hmm. I do not have a big list. Okay. Since <laughs> you are a film g actor guy, mm -hmm. what are your final four actors? Ooh. Male or female? Ooh, that's a tough one. Okay. Living or dead? Living. Okay. That makes it a little easier. <laughs> A little easier. Um, Tom Hiddleston. I can't say Philip Seymour Hoffman, who's one of my favorites. <laughs> um, so Tom Hiddleston. Who? 
Benedict Cumberbatch, right now, this is like right at this mm-hmm. moment, Emma Stone, and Michael Keaton. And who do you have winning? Hmm. I would probably – it would come down between the, – for my championship, it would be between Tom Hiddleston and uh, Michael Keaton, actually. Okay. And I think Hiddleston would, would edge Keaton out, um, mostly because of a Shakespearean mm-hmm. background, okay. um, which is very near and dear to my heart, mm-hmm. believe it or not. How about you? Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know you're not as much of an actor yeah, guy. Okay. If I had to pick, I'd say Chris Evans. I love the movies okay. he's always in. Scarlett Johansson. Uh, Brad Pitt, okay, and Matthew McConaughey. Good pick. And then my finals would be McConaughey against Evans, and McConaughey wins. And a landslide. Yeah, yeah. That I, I can respect that choice. Okay. Do you have any more that you'd like to ask me? Oh, how about your favorite final? Your fi- your yeah, words, words. Your favorite? No. Uh, <laughs> your favorite um, foods. Final four foods. <laughs> okay. Pizza, mm-hmm. without a doubt. Um, I love fish. Okay. Any kind of fish. So I'd say that. Um, I do love chicken, so I'll put that in there. And then, uh, hmm, what do I want my last one to be? Uh, so tough. Ice cream counts if that's one. Okay, I'll put ice cream. Okay, cool. <laughs> I was hoping you were saying ice cream. Desserts <laughs> count. So in the end, I would pick pizza against ice cream and i'd go pizza well congratulations we have the same final four favorite hey, foods so, yeah. and <laughs> championship same with my, same as mine awesome so i feel like that's a pretty good place to end the show today and uh it's end that time banter <laughs> I, it is that time so thank uh, you all very much yes thank you everybody who has who has watched and who has interacted with us it's been great. It's been great. I've also been told that I will be helping out more as a correspondent for Bruce Sports, so I'd like to thank Baxter for giving me that opportunity. Josh, I'd like to thank you for making it a f- great few weeks that we've had here on Bubbler Banter, and I hope that you get to help out more still with the pr- program. And uh, So do I. We'll see where things go, I guess. Yep. <laughs> well, thank you all very much. Have a good one. This has been Bubbler Banter on the Bruce Sports Network.